Okay, folks, um, I'm keen to make a start. If people could uh, uh, kind of just chill back a little bit. Um, so, um, uh, so this session runs for, let me just deal with process for a second. So, so this session runs for two and a half hours. So it's down from three, so I'm a little bit more stretched on time, uh, just because we spent a bit of time um, doing whatever it is we just did. Um, and, uh, and so I'm going to do uh, a fairly short and sharp entry, um, entrance with no slides, since we're assuming at least six blackouts between now and six, and, and six o'clock. So anyone who's using slides is just on a sort of fool's errand. Um, then, then I'm going to get my two colleagues to each uh, kind of punt, uh, and we've chatted, and they're going to be really interesting. That then we're going to throw it out for a bit of conversation about these two examples or any issues coming up from what I said, and then we're going to do broadly sort of the thing on the table that you all did this morning, or most of you will have done this morning in a previous session. So, so we kind of start with the subject, which is displaced people or migrants and refugees. Um, the panel runs through it, we focus on that topic, but then when we get to the tables, we sort of turn the whole thing upside down. And, and, and the use case, you know, or, and displacement becomes a use case for which you can hopefully draw some inspirational lessons that are relevant to your work, and then we'll kind of pull that information uh, back uh, into the room. I'm, I'm looking around at organizers to make sure I haven't said something that's completely wrong, but, but I think it's broadly right. Um, does that make sense? Anybody in the wrong room, science fiction down the road? Uh, I'm still offering anybody to take over my session so that I can join, but no, okay, right, then I will, I will do this. So, so my name is Simon Zadek, I work uh, I'm based in New York, I work for UNDP, I sit in the office of the administrator, I've been there about six months before that, these are only for the UN nerds in the room, um, I was in the EOSG, so I sat in the Secretary General's office for a year, supporting the development of his work on financing, which is sort of my background, um, which is why I'm going to talk about migration, which is definitely not my background, um, and sitting in UNDP, the task I've been asked to look at is, is quite similar to what brings us here to Istanbul today and over the coming days, which is how do we understand some of the changing configurations of what we do? So not how do we understand migration necessarily uh, or X, Y, Z, but how do we understand the changing configurations of not just how we work or how we raise money or what's a project in the UN system, all of that sort of plumbing stuff, which hopefully is not in the room today, but, but how do we understand how we make change in a changing world? Uh, you know, we all know the language of innovation and system thinking and all that stuff now is sort of embedded sadly in our brains and we sort of dream it at night, but, but how do we really translate that into what we do? Uh, and so uh, the question I've been asked by the administration and the senior management team is, what kind of platform would one build at the corporate level in New York that built out a small portfolio of projects uh, focused on large-scale trends uh, that are trying to shift part of the focus of UNDP to upstream intervention, system-level intervention, obviously with implications downstream at the country level, um, but, but to be, sort of get back to something, as I understand, UNDP used to do in the past, but obviously it's today, so we need to figure out how to do that in different ways. And migrants and refugees are sort of one of several pieces of work in the portfolio of this initiative, Project Catalyst. So that's just a five second sort of bio institutional note, uh, and I can now kick on. So I'm, I'm as I said, not gonna use slides. Uh, I am gonna use my iPad since my memory uh, is a little faded. So um, as I said in the room, uh, the subject is migrants and refugees, and I'm just going to keep talking about displaced people, uh, which uh, UNHCR and IOM would tell me is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Um, you know, but I'm just going to use a sort of generic, you know, a sort of generic word, displaced people, for you know, folks that for one reason or another have to leave where they are, end up somewhere else, uh, don't have full rights of citizenship, and are stranded temporarily, but potentially temporarily 
for a hell of a long time. So that's kind of what our subject is, sort of stripping the sort of technocratic language out of the game just, just for now. Uh, we all sort of know the numbers. You know, it depends on how you count it, but there's something like 70 million displaced people today. Yeah, and actually it doesn't matter whether it's 50 or 90, it's sort of, it's a hell of a lot of people uh, and they are scattered around the world. They don't make up an homogenous group except for the fact that they operate without the full rights of citizenship. Yeah, they may be poor. Actually, some of them may not be so poor uh, if they're living in countries where they're able to kind of get other stuff done. Uh, but in the main, it's a humanitarian problem and it's understood as a humanitarian problem. What does that mean? So, so it means that, that in, in very simplistic terms, perhaps not something you would immediately Twitter because it would be a career ender for me, um, um, handling displaced people is a pipeline business. It's a pipeline business. Somebody gets displaced, they end up somewhere where they're in a fragile, perhaps dangerous, perhaps under service supported situation. The job of the displaced people industry is to keep them safe, uh, is to potentially add services, say education for children, and to either get them home or, as I said earlier, sort of metaphorically get them to Sweden. Um, I get them to some other third country that is willing to take them on. Uh, and, and what we know is, is, is that this system is under huge stress, notably over recent years. Obviously, we're in Turkey today, and I'm sure I don't need to say to anyone that Turkey houses you know, the largest number of displaced people of any country in the world, uh, certainly relative to its population, uh, to its standard of living, and so on. So, you know, we're in a, a particular place where this conversation also has unusual merit. Um, does it work? So, so the pipeline model sort of works a bit. You know, we all know that. Uh, but actually what we know is that the numbers are increasing and the duration of someone typically displaced by almost any measure is increasing. 10, 15, 17 years. The number keeps growing all the time, which kind of shows you, if you're interested in a sort of a different kind of a metaphor, that we're moving from a sort of pipeline model like the Rhine or the Rhone, since we're in Europe, more to something like Lake Geneva. You know, Lake Geneva actually also has water flowing through it. It just takes 70 years for water to go from one end to the other end. So it looks like a lake. Actually, it's just a river moving very, very slowly. Yeah, and, and so the displacement challenge becomes that we have more and more people who are in transition, but not really. Not really enough. Yeah? And that's before the numbers get bigger. Yeah? And, and as I said again in the room earlier, um, you know, we have no idea really what the future is going to bring us, but, but we might speculate that, that a mixture of conflict, of climate change, of let me call it the ravages of automation on employment opportunities that creates economic insecurities, you know, at the lower end of skill levels in particular, all of those things are going to drive more and more people to become displaced. Yeah? And as I said, the lower end of the estimates are in the three, four hundred million level by 2040, the higher estimates official, not scaremongering, are in the billion level, are in the billion level. And, and so I have no idea whether it's 300 million or a billion, and at some level I don't care. You know, the, the sort of, the important piece is, it's a hell of a lot of people. It's way more than we have now, and our current model doesn't work properly, so what happens next? Yeah, so what happens next? Do we continue to pour money into countries trying to keep them back, you know, look at the recent deal cut between the US uh, and Mexico, you know, keep them home, send them home. You know, is that really uh, fair, reasonable, just, let alone viable? Um, or do we have to start reconceiving our understanding of what displacement means in the 21st century? Yeah, easy to say, of course, difficult if you're a member of the Rohingya community or in some other highly stressed situation. So it's easy to have a sort of a nice conceptual chat here, and we should try and avoid being sort of flippant about the topic, obviously, deadly serious. And yet at the same time, somewhere, there is a narrative shift that is needed, arguably, in order to help us reconceive the problem and therefore begin to reconceive solutions.
And so the what if, in a sense, becomes what if large numbers of displaced people in some shape or form were conceived of as a global population that were afforded certain rights and responsibilities. Let's call it citizenship, just for laughs. You know, what if you know, a large number of displaced people, by virtue of the data they provide, perhaps, could access livelihood opportunities that, for example, Denmark would not allow today a displaced person to access within the domestic labor market. So you don't even have to go to highly stressed countries. Most countries that are hosting displaced people not only um, you know, are holding them without citizenship, um, but will not allow them to earn a secure livelihood, which of course makes them even more dependent on the state or international funds, which makes them even more resented. So that sort of externality of that toxic politics, which isn't just about displaced people, but begins to influence many other agendas that we're addressing in the broader sustainable development space. So, so it turns out that my nutty suggestion, you know, let's call it a migrant nation, although the language doesn't matter right now, isn't so far away from stuff that's happening already. Yeah, that already we have hundreds and hundreds of innovations, of which we're going to hear two, but there are hundreds of others, uh, of organizations building platforms to enable, largely through service opportunities, enable displaced people to access finance when they can't access finance in their host country, um, to start a business when they're not allowed to start a business within their host country, um, to trade across borders uh, when, in principle, they can't do that, uh, and so on. That actually we have hundreds and hundreds of fascinating innovations around the world that are precisely emerging in order to support a growing number of displaced people that can't, through virtue of their lack of citizenship, access the vertical structure of services and opportunities that would be available if they were living in the country of which they were a citizen. Yeah. So what I'm describing actually is far from mythical, let alone science fiction, which you know, I don't really encourage you to go to, um, and is actually quite real with, an, with a but. And, and the but is, uh, is that all of these initiatives are really small. All of these initiatives are really fragmented. All of these initiatives are underscaled, under-resourced, disconnected, and sit there as individual initiatives, and I'm not pointing at these guys, but I made you later, going, if only we could be bigger, if only we could be scaled up, if only the Danish would give us more money, or you know, if only we could sort of become a bigger organization by virtue of some sort of development operation. On the other hand, one might think about this slightly differently. So here perhaps is a second shift. You know, can you imagine a world of apps without an operating system, without an Apple store? You know, can you imagine a whole series of innovations that you're trying to access that somehow have no interconnectivity, have no common sets of principles, don't require from you as a consumer or a citizen or a displaced person the same set of information? Or c can you imagine you know, a, you know, an NGO platform that's giving you know, small loans to displaced people who aren't connected to another initiative that's doing crowdsourcing or peer-to-peer -peer lending that isn't gathering, gathering money in other ways. So Kiva is sitting there as a really interesting you know, lending platform for displaced people, but it understands its upstream opportunity as being get another bunch of development money, yeah, and then we can on-lend it. Actually, there is no future in a model of that kind. There is no real scale in a model of that kind. So there is a disconnection between some of the many interesting innovations that are out there trying to do exactly what I'm describing, affording, in a sense, rights and responsibilities to people who are displaced. Let's call it citizenship, allowing them to access a whole range of digital services and often livelihood opportunities and pathways. 
And so the notion of the migrant nation um, with the right or the wrong language becomes sort of, does one, is one able to create some sort of operating system, um, some sort of union, some sort of association, yeah, where there are a common set of principles that determine the rights of the individual within it, wherever their displacement might be, but that also determine the way in which those many different crowded in financial services and market opportunities might operate, um, so that they themselves are subject to some level of control, some level of influence, perhaps some level of ownership of displaced people themselves. Yeah. And so that's one of the pieces of work that, um, that we as project catalysts within UNDP are looking at. Now, now I want to just finish with sort of two or three just more sort of cross-cutting observations, um, which come back to the sort of the broader topic that we're addressing um, in the days that we're spending here together. First of all, great idea maybe, maybe not. Um, lots of interesting things going on, but imagine those that are lined up arguing that this is a really bad way of thinking. Not even utopian yeah, or impractical, but a really lousy way of thinking about moving forward. Many people who've worked for many years on migrants and refugee issues you know, have focused much of their energy on trying to enforce and force governments to take on their responsibilities to protect, support, and integrate displaced people into the communities that those governments oversee. They would argue, beginning to think of transboundary solutions that don't involve states but begin to create rights independently of sovereign states actually takes the pressure off of governments to do exactly what we've been asking them to do year on year, decade on decade, month on month. So you have a direct tension between the existing model, which certainly doesn't work as far as, as much as we would like it to, is unlikely to work in the future if the numbers growth are realized as expected. And at the same time, if one takes any pressure away from sovereign states to fulfill their responsibilities, as redefined again within the UN Global Compact on Migrants and the Global Compact on Refugees, the argument is we become part of the solution, but part of the problem, not part of the solution. So, so this articulation between the incumbent approach in this case, which is inadequate but hard fought for and won, and any sort of meta innovation becomes really critical. In, in a complex world, it's very hard to go one plus one equals two, i.e. let's take the incumbent model, add another new idea, and get something more. Yeah, what's more likely is that the interaction between the incumbent model and some new way of doing things has all sorts of unexpected consequences that one's got to at least think about and try and figure out how to deal with. The second part of it really voiced very strongly in a meeting that we held two or three weeks ago in London, one or two people uh, in the room today were there, uh, was a view, let me put it uh, in sort of in a caricatured but realistic way, you know, yet another good idea of what you can do for us, yeah, um, was how it was expressed by many displaced people who were in the room in the conversation. And, and their argument was, you know, thinking about transborder opportunities, affording rights and responsibilities that are not specifically those given by Westphalian states. Um, opening up a digital world that allows people to secure a livelihood when the country, you're, all of that is fine, but it's you lot trying to figure it out for us lot again. You know, where do we as displaced people get into this story as actors of change and of controllers of our own destiny? And so one of the big discussions that happened over the few days in London where we debated this was the the way in which one might connect together not only that sort of critical livelihood piece, which is important, and without which, you know, without which the toxic politics and problems will continue to grow. And on the other hand, the rights of, the rights of displaced people to be party to decisions about the kinds of organizations that provide services. You know, do I like this guy or don't I like this guy? You know, who owns the business that is providing 
these services to the Rohingya community? You know, is he personally benefiting from it? Is he employing disabled people? Kind of what is the ownership structure of his NGO? And so on. Yeah, all, I know you're a wonderful person. Um, yeah, and, and so quite rightly, the questions were framed, you can't just kind of put out and try and push forward a way of thinking about economic opportunities, although it's important, you have to connect it to a way of thinking about governance. You have to connect it to a way of thinking about governance. And then two different things happened. One set of people in the room said, and we need a governance model, and then you know, I put my hands metaphorically over my eyes as they said it, because they sort of described the UN. Um, and I, you know, I've been in the UN long enough to know that's probably not a very good idea. So they described representation and boards and councils and governance models, and then, then we're a nation, right? Because nations organize themselves in that way. Uh, and then we had another bunch of people in the room who you know, were very nice techno geeks, um, and they described how cryptocurrencies you know, could drive high levels of trust, ways in which to assess and you know, give credit or not to, you know, to service organizations you know, that were or weren't sort of what they really needed. They talked about how to intertwine governance far more into the market process of economic development. So, you know, not binary, but two very different ways of thinking about sort of economics plus politics or a political economy where, where markets and governance within a displaced community begin to evolve hand in hand. So, so my simple ask um, uh, is, is first of all, and I don't think this is a difficult ask, is that we appreciate the problem rather than debating the language or the numbers. Now, I don't think that's uh, of great interest. That we understand the importance of economic livelihoods, the work that we focused on, um, whilst in no way reducing the importance of many other aspects of what makes up you know, the, complete, the complete thinking about well-being of displaced people. Yeah, so try not to binary that. And, and thirdly, to kind of try to keep that mind focused on the interaction both between new thinking and the incumbent model for helping displaced people uh, and the economic side of the proposition, if you like, and the political side of the proposition and the way in which they interact with each other. Great, so that was my without slides and without a blackout. Um, so there you go. So no slides, no blackout, lots of slides, instant blackout. Um, so that's my opening. So I'm now going to ask, um, uh, just before I, I mean, is there any sort of somebody sitting there going, holy crap, that's ridiculous, and wants to say something or ask something before I go on to the sort of two key use cases? Okay, can you scream or do you need a, just stand up, you can scream better. Uh, thank you again for these uh, remarks. My name is Wafa. I work for uh, UNDP uh, PAP, Palestine. Um, I was expecting when we talk about displaced population and refugees, not only to think about how we react when the crisis happened, because the world experienced many catastrophic <laughs> crises, like what, had, what happened in Palestine, Syria, happening now in Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, in many countries. Um, and I expect that UNDP needs to think or may think differently about how to be proactive and think about influencing political situation, um, the political agendas and all of that rather than just take care of displaced population because they have become displaced population. So, so Palestinian refugees are refugees from 1948 and now the UNRWA <laughs> Uh, that was invented and created by the UN system is facing this limitation, financial limitation, because of the US administration. So where are we from this? Where, where so, are the solutions and innovative ideas in order to prevent this from happening and to think differently? This is, for me, is how we think differently, other than taking the crisis results and then try to provide some services. Thank you very much. My, uh, completely, my pleasure. So, so just a sort of a short answer, not to trivialize it, but just to sort of keep the process going. So, of course, you're absolutely right. 
that there are many points of intervention that are needed. And actually, I would argue um, UNDP has almost exclusively focused on the area that you're identifying, which is the development process within countries. Yeah? And, and that's actually UNDP's history because displacement has been understood as a humanitarian issue and what happens in individual countries has been understood as a development issue. And of course, we all know that the UN is broken up into peace and security, humanitarian and development without wanting to oversimplify uh, the different pillars. But, but what happens, uh, not if you're wrong, but what happens if one begins to see that the bit that we have conceived of as being the humanitarian approach of dealing with crisis, so you know, if it's gone wrong, if one hasn't managed to prevent it going wrong, you know, becomes a permanent part of our development architecture. I guess, so, so my, 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 I think my response would be a sort of an and-and. I think UNDP in particular, in the UN system, uh, but also other UN agencies, focuses actually almost exclusively on that, that kind of pre-crisis problem uh, or pre-crisis challenge and opportunity to try and prevent displacement. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I, I guess I'm sort of casting into that second side and going, what, what happens if that's no longer just a manifestation of individual crisis, but a permanent feature of the way in which our world works? Is there a development lens that we need to throw on that that goes beyond a humanitarian response and therefore requires different kinds of institutions, different kinds of governance processes, different ways of understanding what the evolution of communities that are displaced really means over the long term. So it's an and and in my view, not a, you know, it's either or. Any other sort of, let's move on, we have time, brilliant. Okay, so um, we're gonna start, I think we're gonna start with you, yeah? Um, and yeah, does that make sense or do you wanna? Okay, and so let's start with the Rohingya case and then move on to the healthcare one. 